Awesome. Hello. My name is Emily Withrow. I'm the director of the Quartz Bot Studio. Is the mic working? Yes. No. no. Is the mic working now? Maybe. Can you listen? Hello. Hello. I hear myself. Do you guys hear me? Okay. Hello. My name is Emily Withrow. I'm the director of the Quartz Bot Studio. Um, we design narrative experiences for voice and chat platforms. What does that mean? It means we build story software that you can talk to. So when it comes to smart speakers, when it comes to interactive audio, we're really looking at that assistive space, at that captive space. Move my hair. You're ruining my look. Oh my god. Okay, guys. Oh my god. I revoke my permission to use my image. Um, okay, so, <laughs> um, so what does that mean? Story software you can talk to. Imagine if you could have an intelligent conversation with the people who are writing the news, reporting the news. What does that look like? Um, this has been an obsession of mine for a really long time. This idea of one-size-fits-all journalism, uh, being problematic. You know, Emily Goligowski was talking earlier about multiple audiences. Um, so I've been trying to crack that problem for a while. And speaking of captive audiences, um, the births of Siri and Alexa coincided with the births of my two children. Um, and I was armless, right? Suddenly, I was relying on my voice more than ever to try to achieve things on my phone, to try to achieve things anywhere that I could, right? Um, and so that's a different type of captive audience, right? So we have to think about the different use cases for this. Um, and we're really looking at the future of this technology. So you know, there's the current state of smart speaker technology, but there's also how this technology is going to be built into computing going forward, right? And so what does this look like when it's just in your ear and you don't have a screen? What does this look like when you're on the go? We're thinking through all of those scenarios um, and really trying to crack the problem of, um, of this idea of interactive news, this idea of sort of personalized um, news delivery at the story level. So not the algorithm that changes up the menu of what you get, but what changes the actual unfolding of the story in front of you. So, let's play a game. It has to do with Game of Thrones. Okay, so um, raise your hand if you know the first and the last name of this character. This character? This guy? Samuel Tolley. Okay, um, and this one. Ooh, okay, so it's a deep cut, kind of, it's sort of annoying. Okay, um, so before you're thinking, like, are we going to talk about Game of Thrones, this is something that we do in conversation all of the time, right? We are trying to figure out who we're talking to. Game of Thrones, final season, premieres tomorrow. We're all very excited. Those of us who are excited are constantly trying to figure out, like, who am I talking to? Am I talking to a fan? Am I talking to somebody who's read the books? Am I talking to somebody who has no interest in dragons? Like, well, why? They're so cool, right? Uh, so we do this in conversation. We, we ask these questions. We try to figure out who we're talking to so that we adjust. We turn the dial of our delivery just as an interlocutor, right? So that we are delivering information that's sort of at, you know, customized to you. We do this as humans. And when we're thinking about conversation design for voice, for something you might type to, what we're trying to do is figure out <laughs> in an ambient way, not in a scary way where we're like purchasing data, but in an ambient way, figuring out who we're talking to so that we can adjust the story to fit you. All right, come on, slide. It's a work in progress, right? Um, it, these systems are not perfect. We see, you know, we're in sort of the infancy of, um, of, all, of all of these devices and really the technology, um, but you know, I hope that as news organizations, we will recognize them in babies as babies and sort of invest in their future. We're like, yeah, you're kind of dumb right now, but you're going to be smart. Let's, you know, let's spend some time together. Let's grow together. Um, that we don't just move into the space and say, like, ah, it's useless. People aren't engaging, right? People will. Um, so 
how do, why do we do this, right? One-on-one -on -one is really different. Um, it's, it's often a private channel. Um, sometimes it's a public channel. If these are in people's homes, it's more like, you know, the, we're all sitting around listening to the radio <laughs> together. Um, but we're, we're arriving to a single person, right? And the, that's really, really different from a lot of the other types of media that we consume. <laughs> and what we can do in these individual environments, is that five minutes to go? Cool. Um, what we can do in these individual environments is check in with people, right? So if you are doing a recipe, right, and you're saying, okay, the surface is dotted with bubbles. This is, you know, in making bread. You need to see bubbles. It means the yeast is working. So we can check in with people at that moment and say, do you see bubbles? <laughs> right? And if they say, yeah, I see bubbles. Right, you continue. If they say no, you go into like a yeast troubleshooting section, <laughs> right? Um, this is the same thing when we're talking about cryptocurrency or Bitcoin or conflict in Syria, right? We can check in with our audience on a regular basis to figure out whether or not they're following, whether or not they're with us, and then again, sort of change the story <laughs> to fill in the gaps that people need filling. This is something that we saw in traditional storytelling, too, in oral storytelling. We do these checks with audiences frequently to make sure that they're still with us. Same principles apply here. So how do we do it? I'm going to move into some quick tips. I'm going to respect my time limit here. Um, this is a, is a question I'm obsessed with, <laughs> okay? Because when you think about affordances, when you think about design, what are the design affordances of conversation? What? Okay, so when we talk about conversation, I'm going to make sure to check my notes, right? So James Gibson, I, have, I live in fear of making a factual error on stage, so I have all my facts here. Um, James Gibson, 1977, psychologist, coins the term affordance, and it's really any possible action you can do, right? So an affordance of a trumpet is you can play a trumpet, uh, but also an affordance of a trumpet is like you can chuck it across the room, right? Technically, if you're physically capable, you can, it's an affordance. Later on, we skip to 1988, we look at Dan Norman, correct? Don Norman, 1988, HCI, Design of Everyday Things, and we shift the definition to all perceived actions, right? So this is what makes a button look pushable, but when we look at conversation as a whole, when we look at dialogue as a whole, we're a lot closer to the previous definition, right? Because so much is possible in a conversation, and with humans, if what you're looking at is like, well, how does a human behave? It's really kind of the sky is the limit. So how do we, how do we approach this? Um, number one, focus on the user, right? This is, okay, I'm not gonna linger on Game of Thrones. Um, but to a reasonable degree, right? Figure out who is in your audience, who are you talking to? You have your casual fans, you have the hardcore fans. You can also do tonal shifts, right? You have people who take Game of Thrones very, very seriously. And then you have like goofballs who watch it also. So you can pick up on these clues, shift the story around people, and then you gotta let it go. You gotta let go of the idea that you, master storyteller that you are, have the perfect delivery of this story, right? That there is one way to tell this story and you are the person that's gonna do that. You don't know the life experiences of all of the people who are reading your content, right? Um, so we can give some of that power to them, but you have to let go of the idea that there is one way. So you identify what's essential for every group, like everybody, what are the key features of the story that everyone must know, and then what's essential for these other groups, right? How do I fill in those gaps as I go? Three, fight the infinity wars. We have a, ten a tendency to do this like branching narrative thing in this space where you're like, oh, well, I'll make a path here and I'll make a path here. Save yourselves the time and the effort because if you go in all those directions, you're doing so much work for a very limited user experience. So what we end up doing 
if you were to model the narrative structure of the stories we do, it looks a mo lot more like a chain. It's like this weaving of pulling in a fact that you might not know, pulling in this, pulling in this for this person. And so it's still a linear construct. You can still own the trajectory of that story as you should as a reporter, as a journalist. Um, but you can include other pieces as well. Um, okay, so I'm not saying you all are sheep. <laughs> I'm really not. Um, but you have to fight this open world problem because in these spaces where people can and will say anything to you, you have to decide, okay, what am I gonna field? And again, there are three cases that actually matter. They're up here, right? There is uh, a person who needs help who's gonna interrupt your flow to say, I need something. Um, there is the abusive people of the world who will yell profanity at your machine. Interesting. Um, and then you have the curious people. These are the people who are trying to figure out the boundaries. Um, the first news experience that I built was a, was a news quiz. It was four years ago. It was interactive audio um, for um, whatever. It doesn't matter. But we mentioned the Super Bowl during one of the stories. And the person cuts in and says, who won the Super Bowl in 1984, right? This is not a total jerk. This is a curious person who's trying to figure out the bounds of the experience, right? So you can field that with an error, and it's fine. But if you field other things as error, it's just going to enrage people. If people shout profanity at you, you say, well, I don't know, they're just going to rage. Um, and the same thing for if people need help and they get that. Um, so game it out. Figure out how you're going to walk people through. Figure out how you're going to um, think about that open world problem. I'm really going, hello. Um, and to embrace the chaos, right for it, right for the unpredictable nature, right for, this is my favorite exchange of just like people talking to us and um, the machine making the choice about what to uh, play back. But, Embrace the chaos, write for that sort of ambiguity. Understand that you're not going to be able to control every single back and forth. Um, and finally, if you're interested in experimenting in the interactive audio space, this is a tool that we made. It's on Glitch. You can remix it. Um, the secret is to get started, you don't have to do any code. You just have to have access to like a microphone and record yourself. Because if you open your computer and you just play audio, People think they're talking to Alexa, it's fine. So you can create interactive audio experiences, you can get a lot of information about them without having to write a line of code, and then once you've gotten your idea, then you can enlist the developers. All right, thank you.